Hey everybody, this month's roundup is brought to you by Arcane Wonders and their new expansion, World Wonders, the Mundo Wonders Pack. Now folks, I've already got coverage of World Wonders on the channel. Kimberly did an excellent run through. Uh, there's links for that down in the show notes if you want to know how the core tile laying works. I'm just going to tell you what's new in this expansion, which is going to be available very soon at retail outlets. Oh, and it is worth it because you get nine new wonders. And of course, World Wonders is all about the tension of trying to build those wonders and more cool little three-dimensional wonders like the Sphinx or the Hanging Gardens of Babylon or look at this awesome little Stonehenge here uh, is very very cool and of course there's a bunch of cards uh, that come you just shuffle these in with the cards from the original expansion and they have their own uh, requirements to get them built and they're worth you know different wards and all that so that's all very very cool and that would be enough but what's really neat is the mundo element instead of shuffling in regular cards you can use these mundo cards and if you get these uh um things built, like the Olmec uh, Gigantic Heads or the Terracotta Army, it gives you additional objectives you're trying to chase after now for the rest of the game. Hang Garden Babylon, it wants to be surrounded completely like a regular city tile, uh, so that it can be worth three instead of one. The Great Sphinx wants to be next to a couple of other wonders. This thing doesn't want to be alone, so uh, it, may, it changes how you're going to build if you build this thing. The Colossus of Rhodes is worth more points the more um, city tiles you have on water, which of course is very appropriate for it thematically. The Terracotta Army wants to be spread out, and then you need to fill the spaces in between the um, the different statues. Oh, but this is my favorite one: the uh, the Gate of Nations. The Gate of Nation needs to literally be built over a road, and it's really really cool that it goes over the top like this. But the longer the road that the Gate of Nations is over, the more points it's worth. So, folks, uh, this extra twist of uh, extra objectives to chase after if you build these is such a cool leveling up for the game which makes the world wonders mundo wonder pack as far as i'm concerned a must have if you love the original tile layer like i do okay folks uh that was it for the sponsorship and now Let's uh, talk about a bunch of new games that I played over the month of February. Although, let's go on ahead and stand all these up now, uh, just because they're so cool. Oh, look at the little Mundo. There we go. Anyway, okay, so what have I got? 16 games that uh, I'm ready to talk about this month that we played in the month of uh, of uh, March, which was our last month on the road, uh, we went to the Dice Tower West uh, the Dice Tower West convention, so we played a bunch of games there, played uh, several games when I got home, and uh, there's nothing to it but to do it, folks. So let's just start the countdown, beginning with number 16 on the list, The Isle of Night, where you explore an island that appears only at night. Now, this is the latest from Red Raven Games. It's going to be available soon. Like I said, I got to play this uh, early at the convention, and it is a neat game. Make no mistake about it. There aren't very many pictures on Board Game Geek yet, unfortunately. There's no real videos of it because it's not available. But this is, at its heart, a very simple competitive card game where on your turn, you're going to draw three cards, put them out on a common display, and over time, more and more cards are appearing on this display, and then you're going to pick one type of card and grab all of them. So if you if the three cards you drew, um, one of them was a butterfly and there was already some other butterflies out there, you could grab all the butterflies, which is a set collection element of the game. Or um, if there was a spear, you could grab a spear. And a spear has a special power that when you grab it, it lets you pick up a dragon because you slay the dragon with the spear. So all these different types of cards have different special abilities on them. Either that or they're worth points. And um, so you're trying to figure out, right, okay, I don't want to grab that right now. I'd really rather wait for it to come around and hopefully a few more of them because I don't want to just get one of those things. I want to get several of those things. But other players might grab it ahead of you. So there's a lot of head games, you know, trying to figure out what's the right time to grab these different um, cards. The important thing, though, is as part of setup, you get this little, um, you know, layout of cards off to the side that shows what the different cards are worth. In this particular setup, butterflies 
they're not worth nothing. Uh, they're at the bottom of the food chain. Um, you know, and dragons are kind of here in the middle. They're worth three points. So are the beetles, and um, you know, and so on. And the spears are the most valuable thing in the game. So you better grab those spears. You want to grab all those spears. Hooray! Plus they have their special power of helping you kill dragons, or maybe it was serpents. Anyway, though, here's the trick. A lot of the cards let you manipulate those scorecards. So if somebody else is doing really well. Uh, getting a lot of dragons, well, then you might want to grab those cards that tank the market and suddenly make dragons worthless and make your beetles that you're collecting climb their way up. But then other people might crash the market for beetles. So the, val the point value of the cards you're drafting is constantly shifting. And you never know exactly when the game is going to end because there are these lanterns, which are just worth a point, just nice and simple. And when enough lanterns have been grabbed, that's the end of the game. So you might think you're in the lead and you want to snag all those lanterns as they um, build up. But other players don't want them snagged because they're still trying to catch up. So there's a lot, again, mind games that go on with this, trying to figure out, I drew three cards, I'm going to take something from the display. And over the course of the game, the display gets bigger and bigger bigger and bigger with more and more options as you try to navigate the Isle of Night. And now I'll say right now, folks, this is a cool game. It's a smart design. I would expect nothing less from Red Raven Games. So why did it come in at the bottom of the list? Um, you know, because this, of course, is a countdown from my least favorite to my most favorite. Well, I just kind of described it. This game is very mean-spirited. Oh, the uh, aggressive moves you can make. Really messing with your opponents. They've worked so hard, they're going to do really well, and then you just crash their economy. Jen and I did not enjoy this at all. And ironically, this is the only game at Dice Tower West that I got to play with Maggie, of Amy Maggie, one of my favorite people in the world. And I destroyed her um, because she was doing so well. I think she was collecting butterflies, so I just completely tanked that market. And it prevented her from getting the win and allowed me to climb my way up. But I did not enjoy that at all. So, folks, if you are looking for a very, very in-your-face interactive card game with a really simple rule set that plays really, really quick. Well, you might want to check out number 16 of the month, The Isle of Night. Okay, now let's move on to number 15, The Colors of Kasane. And right here, I've got a video from the designer of the game uh, from nine years ago. This game has been out for quite a while. And again, I got to play it at the Dice Tower West Convention Library. And this is a very sweet, fast-playing little card drafting game that uses the idea of hand management from what's it called? Bonanza, where the cards in your hand, you cannot rearrange them. Whatever order they're in your hand, that's the order you must play them. And in this game, what you're going to do is you're drafting cards. You always have to take one from the bottom of one of the piles, add it to your hand. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the cards in your hand in one of several different um, configurations, like a straight or um, three odd cards next to each other or three even cards next to each other. I forget, there's like over a half a dozen different ways you could score. So, so you're drafting cards, trying to get them in these particular layouts, and then you can pull them out of your hand, score them, and then that will make the rest of your hand collapse, and hopefully you'll be able to score more stuff depending on how you've laid things out. It's a clever little game, nice and fast, uh, really charming little components. You score with literal um, fabric-covered buttons, and uh, yeah, we very much enjoyed it. <clears throat> Why does it rank higher? Well, because it is a simple, fast-playing little game, a little bit on the light side. Plus, in all honesty, it's a lot to keep track of. I think, is it like nine different ways you could score? And they're all active every single time you play. So in spite of the fact that it's a nice little set collection game, um, was it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Yeah. Keeping track of all the nine different ways you could score. I mean, I kind of wish it was more like, hey, you know, every time you play, there are six different ones. So the game feels a little bit different from game to game. It doesn't need it. I mean, because there's certainly variability, just the way that you can draft these cards. And you can see, if I take this one, I'm revealing the one underneath it. And and that's an odd. And I think you've got a lot of odd cards. Do I want to give that to you? Or do I want somebody else to clear that one out of the way so that I could snag it? It's a fun, sharp uh, little game. We enjoyed it. But again, very, very light. Uh, and we're generally looking for something a little bit heavier. But still, very charming. I would recommend it as a nice little gateway card game. That is number 15, The Colors of Kasane. Okay. Now, 
Let's move on to number 14, The Siege of Valeria. Now, this is a solo-only tower defense game uh, set in the Valeria Card Kingdoms universe from Daily Magic Games uh, with awesome art, as always, by the Miko. I just love the look of these cards and the gameplay is really sharp too because what we're doing is let me see if I've got if there's a picture here on board game geek with the whole game set up lots of beauty shots of the components there we go there's the game set up your by yourself this is a solo only game <clears throat> which I should say by the way is the only reason it's ranked so low if there had been a co-op mode for this oh it would have ranked so high it's a great solo experience though what happens is uh, you're protecting five towers on your battlement walls from a huge grid of monsters that are um, you know randomly arrayed and on your turn you've got some dice red and blue you know the standard colors of Valeria to represent strength and magic you roll them and then you combine those dice to attack the monsters that are on the front row of you know that are right about to slay slam into the wall and do damage to it. The more damage the wall takes, the more likely you are to lose because if one tower falls, you instantly lose. So you're spreading your dice, adding them together because these monsters have different requirements, how much damage you have to do to them. Sometimes they need might, sometimes they need might and magic. So you have to split your dice up. You can combine dice. Uh, gr uh, blue dice can also supplement red dice. There's uh, some simple, straightforward rules for how you use the dice. But the important thing is, once you take one of these monsters, monsters out, they immediately go into your hand and give you a special power. So this game is full to the brim of very cool, clever combo um, turns where you're like, I have to destroy this thing now. It's going to take my wall down or it's going to really mess me over. But I don't have the, the, um, the dice I need to take it out. But if I take out this other creature over here, and um, because it only needs a three and then boom, it comes into my hand, then I can play that card and it lets me turn a one into a six and then that will let me take out the thing that's the real danger. Um, and that's just a really simple combo. As the game goes on, you can get to some very, very cool, nice combo chains as you plow your way through monster after monster after monster um, trying to take out all these slots, uh, this onslaught, wave after wave of bad guy. Now, up at the top are the siege engines. To win, you have to destroy a certain number of siege engines before time runs out, uh, before you run out of uh, regular monsters, before the wall falls, uh, before one of the siege engines actually hits the wall. And um, it's a fun, fast, puzzly game. I really enjoyed playing it. I did a solo run through as a monthly recluse show for backers of Rotto Runs Through. I had a great time doing it. My only complaint, well, my two complaints are one, it is a shame. That, oh man, why can't there be a two-player mode where we take turns and we have different cards and we have to, you know, you know, help each other and stuff like that. But it's fine. Still a great solo game. My other complaint is it's a little on the easy side. And honestly, it needs more difficulty level options. The only thing you can do is make it even easier. There's no way to increase the difficulty. And that's kind of a cardinal sin for um, uh, solo games, or cooperative games for that matter. Once you get good at it, you need to make it more um, challenging to beat. And in the base game, there's not. Now, there is sold separately a campaign expansion that adds that. And that sounds really, really cool. I bet I would really enjoy it. And Honestly, if you like Siege of Valeria, you'll want to get this for more replayability. But really, in the core box, there should have been something to increase the difficulty level, which is what brings Siege of Valeria in at number 14. <clears throat> of the month. Okay, now let's move on to number 13, Gun It, a timed cooperative game. There are no pictures of this or videos of it on BoardGameGeek, so I'm just going to the uh, website for this game, uh, which is going to be coming to Kickstarter soon. Uh, this is not a sponsored uh, blurb for me. I just got to play it with my wife, Jen, at the convention, and I thought it was very, very cool. Um, it basically replicates the feeling of an action movie where there is a running gunfight uh, a car chase because we are a car and see so you can hear, see it here set up and we're surrounded by enemy vehicles motorcycles cars trucks all kinds of things and what we do is you know what actually uh, let me go on ahead and zoom in on this picture uh, open this as a new tab there we go yeah 
So, we also have a handful of cards. And the coolest thing about this game, and there's several cool things about it, is where you sit at the table determines where you're sitting in the car. Um, you are either the driver in the passenger seat or in one of the two rear seats. And if I'm in the passenger side rear seat, that means if I've got an Uzi or a shotgun or a pistol or whatever, I get to shoot at enemies um, in the rear... Uh, what did I say? The passenger? In the rear... Um, you know, uh, passenger side. I, I'm the only one who can shoot at the one that's diagonally behind us, or I can shoot directly behind us. But I can't shoot that what's um, you know over you know on the driver's side on the front because I'd literally be shooting over the driver's head. I can shoot over there, but then I run the risk of accidentally shooting my teammate and winging them in the ear or something like that. This game is so full of thematic little flourishes like that because what happens is. Um, all, you're surrounded by all these cars. We talk about what we want to do. Um, and then we have a timer. I forget what it was. I think we get two minutes, something like that, to figure out how are we going to share cards back and forth. Because one player has the steering wheel. They're the driver. And of course, they're sitting in the spot on the uh, table that would be in the driver's seat. But if they want to, if the uh, if there's an enemy we have to destroy that's right next to them, they should shoot at it. So they could say, here, take the wheel. And they can literally hand the wheel card to the uh, person that's sitting next to them in the passenger seat and then that person can hand them a gun so they can shoot out the window. And that, again, that's just a very simple example. This game is so overflowing with really cool thematic flourishes and tons of replayability because it's got tons of different modules you can turn on as you get better and better at the game. Like the longer we played it at the convention, we started turning on more and more stuff. And by the end of our session, at one point, I literally uh, used a card to climb out of the back seat, jump, get up onto the hood of the car that was driving, you know, 70 miles an hour down the freeway, jump to another car, sh um, from the roof of that car, shoot at an enemy that I wasn't normally able to shoot at, and meanwhile, while I was doing that, Jen, who was behind the wheel, wrenched the um, car to slam into something beside us so that I could jump back into the car, climb back in, before time ran out. That's what this game is overflowing with. And I'll always remember that moment. It was so freaking cool. And meanwhile, the other thing, all these enemy cars we have have arrows on them. If you take out one of the uh, cars, the arrows indicate the explosive damage. So you can actually create a chain reaction of this car slams into that car, which slams into that car, which slams into that motorcycle, if you can just take out one particular car. So you've got all this strategizing about how to create these combo chains of you know, of uh, auto carnage on the freeway. I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, over here on the uh, cage, the designer of monikers and wavelength, Justin Vickers apparently played this at a convention and said, it's the closest I've come to being in a car chase. And yeah, um, it's interesting. This game is from, like me, a video game designer. And I'm loving to see this. More video game people coming into the board game space and bringing in a new aesthetic, a new energy. Because this, to me, feels like a video game. Uh, you know, all these really cool moments. Or it feels like Matrix Reloaded, you know, the, the one of the most epic uh, freeway action scenes in all of cinematic history. And you're playing it, and you're making real tough, interesting dis uh, decisions under pressure in a cooperative game. It's neat. Neat, neat, neat. I would personally rank this super high in my top 10, maybe my top five of the month. I'm bringing it down though because when I'm giving you these um, numbers, folks, I am um, taking my wife into account, and there's one real, pro there's two problems with it for her. One, the time pressure is crunchy, and this is definitely a game where once the timer starts. Um, if you're worried about what's the, what's the word um, quarterbacking, right? Or one player just kind of takes control of everything and tells other players what to do. This game could definitely have that happen. Yes, everybody's responsible for their own stuff, but somebody's saying, here, you need to take this and give me your shotgun and you need to do this and that. That could happen. So that's something if you play with people who are pushy like that or if you play with people who feel intimidated and aren't really comfortable in a real-time sequence and you know, speaking up, that can create some discomfort around the table. So you got to know that going in. And then also, my wife just didn't like the theme at all. She did not want an Uzi in her hand and trying to shoot at somebody on a motorcycle so they could 
could blow up and, and blow up three other cars. So you got to love the subject matter. I do love the subject matter. There is so much variability baked into this game. Like I said, this would probably make, if not my uh, top five, my top 10 of the month for my taste. I love everything about it. But taking my wife's needs into account, which I always do on the channel, uh, it comes in at number 13 of the month. Oh man, folks, watch for this when it goes on crowdfunding. Gun it. All right, now let's move on to number 12 uh, of the month. It's Sankore, the pride of Mansa Musa. And, you know, we're early in 2024. But I got to say, I, I believe this must be the heaviest game that has come out so far. This is a big... Uh, both in terms of scope of the uh, simulation, but also just the physical size on the table. Gigantic, crunchy Euro, all about a medieval Arabic world and trying to run universities to educate the populace. Because during that dark time in history, the Arabic world is where all the uh, learning and education was going on. And so that's what we're trying to do. At its heart, there's a core simple idea here. We're recruiting students to come to our university. We're putting them in these um, classes that are for, I forget what they are, they're mathematics, astronomy, religion, and law. I believe those are the four topics. And there, those four topics have four different sections of the main board. And if I put a, if I recruit a student and um, you know, have them study law, that allows me to uh, activate and manipulate the law portion of the main board. And each of the four portions works very differently. And the better the student... And the better my curriculum for the law, the more actions I get to do in the law section of the board. Whether it's um, you know, doing area control stuff or building stuff or board traversal, that's what the astronomy game is. So you've got four separate games all glommed together, tied together by the classes. And the interesting thing about the classes is as the game goes on, you build second year and third year and fourth year classes. So your student who took a year one class could then later jump up to a year two and a year three three in a year four and get more and more powerful the actions you get to do up on the main board. And then all four of these things on the main board, they're all dovetailed together. Doing more stuff in law is going to make you more powerful in religion. Doing stuff in astronomy is going to make you more powerful in mathematics. And so there's so much interplay, so much interconnectedness. Uh, this game is big and crunchy and heavy and long. Um, and both Jen and I really liked it. Uh, we actually tried to play this in my RV on our tiny little RV dinette table and it floweth over. It was a challenge to do it, but we were both super impressed. Now, I have to say, at the end of the day, it's maybe just a little bit more crunchy than what Jen and I are looking for these days. I mean, this gives Vita Lasarda a run for his money, quite frankly. I would say this is at the upper end of the Vita Lasarda depth and complexity um, rating for games. And me and Jen, we're kind of more in the medium or lower end of Vita Lasarda. That's what we're looking for. So for us, Sankore was a brilliant design, but maybe just a little bit more than what we're looking for. And if you'd like to see more about it, folks, you can check out Shay did a fantastic run through of it. Uh, and I didn't envy him because, oh my gosh, it's such a big beast with so many moving parts. Uh, that is number 12 of the month, Sankore, uh, the pride of Mansa Musa. Okay. Now, let's move on to number 11, The Heroes of the Sanctum, a strategy card game. And now, this was a sponsored preview uh, for a game I did, and I really enjoyed this one quite a bit. At its heart, this is a co-op game where you either play solo, or if you get the... Uh, it comes as a solo game. And it's just a tiny deck of cards and some whatchamacallem, the tokens in a tiny little box. And yet, in spite of its tiny little stature, it gives you such a big gameplay experience. It offers so much. Um, because, first of all, the game comes, I forget, with something like 10 or 12 different adventures you can play that um, you know change the order and create special rules and stuff like that. It comes with, I forget, I mean, just tons of monsters to fight, tons of playable characters, all who have special powers, tons of adventures, tons of locations, tons of uh, you know special powers within those locations. Just the base game alone has more content in it than most 
big box co-op adventure games. It's a miracle how they squeeze so much into this tiny little box. And then if you get a second tiny little box, you can turn it into a multiplayer game as well, which is what I'm actually showing here on the screen. Although my run-through showed the solo mode and the multiplayer mode. And here's the interesting thing about this. Uh, you know, it's full of what you expect. Terrible, horrifying monsters just coming at us wave after wave. Us fighting them off, using our special powers, helping each other in times of need, trying to complete quests, um, you know, search for items, um, you know, beat monsters and get more loot to become more powerful, swap loot between players, all the stuff you would expect from this kind of game. From a big, bombastic game in this tiny little fast-playing package. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, what's most exciting to me about it is there's no dice. This game is 100% procedural. No randomness. Every, th every decision you make is going to play out exactly as you want. So, um, it's everything I just said. All the big drama and narrative excitement, but it's also a brilliant fun, compelling puzzle to solve. Uh, because it's not just at the whim of card draws or dice rolling or what have you. And I love that and I want to see more of that, please. But then the other thing that makes this so special is, at its heart, it's a worker placement game. It's not driven by, oh, I've got five action points and I'll spend three action points to move over there and then I'll spend an action point to ready my weapon and my final action point, I'll attack the monster and then I'll roll the dice. We've seen this in hundreds of games over the years, but we rarely see a game that's driven by worker placement. Uh, the worker placement works differently depending on whether you are playing multiplayer or solo, but both systems work really, really smart. And we, um, every character, every playable character has a little chip that they put on a little card. And these cards are constantly updating, represent the different actions we have available to us. And we have to figure out what is everybody going to do every turn within the restrictions of worker placement rules. And that elevates this so far above and beyond. I really love this one a lot. The reason it comes in... Oops. Oh, shoot. Sorry, folks. The reason it comes in at number 11 of the month, I failed to update my text file, is only that this was a freaking amazing month. Um, any other month, I could have seen this in you know in the top tier. Uh, like I said, it was a sponsored preview. I really enjoyed it quite a bit, as did my wife, Jen. I thought she was going to be turned off because it's very dark. I mean, this is a dark, apocalyptic fantasy world, um, you know, and so it's kind of off-putting and, you know, and grim uh, and all that, but the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal, and that is number 11 of the month, Heroes of the Sanctum. Then we move on to number 10 of the month, One Hit Heroes. Uh, another uh, sponsored preview I did for a game that is crowdfunding, and man, Another great, super fun, fast-playing, cooperative adventure experience. Now, this one is a straight-up boss battler. Every time you play, you're going to pick one boss. And the game, if I recall correctly, what does it come with? Uh, four, I think it comes with like si either 12 or 16. I think it's 16 unique bosses. Plus, the base box comes with, was it five different heroes? You can check out the crowdfunding page if you want to know more. Plus, it's already got expansions for more heroes, more bosses, and all of that. So it comes with a ton of flexibility, a ton of variety. But how does the gameplay work? Well, it's in the title. In this game, we are literally one-hit heroes. Each player um, has one hit point. And if you take one point of damage, you die. And if anybody dies, we instantly lose. So this game creates such a rush of tension and adrenaline as the uh, bad guys... And by the way, I, I gotta say, one of the things I love about this game is you, at the beginning of your turn, you reveal what the bad guy is gonna do, and you have till the end of your turn to respond to it. So you know what the bad guy is gonna do. Um, although there is some variability, because sometimes they'll roll dice and surprise you, and, um, you know, with the, Oh, I thought they were going to do that, but they're doing this thing instead. But anyway, um, you can prepare for that. And we are trying to hit the bad guy as fast as we can, playing cards from our hand. We have a hand of five. We can play three of them every round. And this game is so overloaded with ways for players to interact with each other through the use of these cards to help each other to distract the monster. Because here's the thing. Every time I successfully hit the monster, uh, the little hit point tokens that are represented by these big and small damage tokens, they don't just get removed from the game. The, I have to take them and they be represent the aggro, the um, the anger that the monster is coming towards me. And the more aggro we have, the more likely we are to be hit when the monster strikes. And don't forget, if the monster hits us once, we die. And so there's just this constant, just 
fear and pressure and trying to ally because we're one step away from death the whole time. Except not really. Because each player has a couple of cool items that give you extra special benefits uh, in addition to whatever cards you play. And if you take a hit... Rather than dying, you have to jettison one of your cool, super powerful items, and then it's gone. And once they're both gone, then you're totally exposed. So that is a painful choice as well. If I do take a hit, if I have to take a hit, what super powerful um, armor or weapon or item am I going to jettison to stay alive? Because if I don't, we all die. The game, every boss, uh, and I have, we have played eight of the, I think, 16 bosses that come with the game. They all work radically differently. There's so much variety. The cool special powers of the different playable characters are great too. I love the uh, the you know the art style as well. Both Jen and I really enjoyed this one. Um, and you know, I mean, so much so that, like I said, we played this thing eight times to experience every single boss that came in our prototype. We were having so much fun playing this in the RV. Um, you know, again, any other month this would have rated much higher, but. February 2024 was an amazing month for us, and that was when we got to play number 10 on the list, One Hit Heroes. Okay, now let's move on to number 9 on the list, Caldera Park. And now this is a sequel to an excellent tile laying game that I've covered in the past called Savannah Park, and I love Savannah Park. One of my favorite run-throughs I ever did on the channel. You can go watch my run-through for Savannah Park, because it was me and Ruel playing it um, remotely uh, in the run-through. And um, Caldera Park is the same core idea of Savannah Park, in that we are trying to make a nature conservancy to take care of animals, now in Caldera instead of Savannah. Um, and every round, whoever is the lead player picks one tile, and all other players have to say, oh, okay, I'm going to take that same tile and I have to lay it out somewhere on my um, player board trying to get types of animals together. Try to get all my wolves together. Try to get all my bears together. Try to get all my mooses. Meese? whatever, together, uh, and try to get them around watering holes because the bigger a group of bears and the more watering holes that that group can reach, the more points my bears are worth. But I don't always get to place the bears when and where I want because sometimes on your turn, you'll say, bears! And um, what's more, you'll say, uh, everybody has to place a bear tile in a forest. And I'm like... I want to place a bear, but I want to place it in the plains. You're making me place a bear in the... Oh, how am I going to figure this out? Okay, well, if I put it over here, it can maybe wrap around and reach the other group of bears. Um, you know, this has always been what made Savannah Park so interesting and engaging in that when I'm the lead, I get to choose what everybody does, but then other people are choosing for me, and then you've got to puzzle out the best way to jigsaw this together. And what's more, this game adds a lot of extra touches because in the original game, hey, just pick a tile and say, now we have this core central board that says um, what I'm choosing and what type of location it goes to. And if I choose something, if I say bears have to go into the forest and you look and you say, oh, my forest is filled up, then that means you can put bears wherever you want. Or, oh, I'm out of bears, then that means you can put whatever you want in the forest. So there's more flexibility than there was in the original Savannah, which is very, very cool. Plus, there's this extra idea of slowly, over the course of the game, on the outskirts of your board, revealing disaster tiles that will say, oh, because of this flooding, no bears can be placed there. If any bears are placed next to this flooding area, I forget which, or maybe the bears were afraid of the storms, I don't remember. But anyway, any bears that are there have to go away. And the thing is, over the course of the game, we have to place these every once in a while as well. And um, so, you want to get those disasters placed before you get your animals placed, but sometimes you've got to take a gamble. Like I said earlier, and okay, I'm I'm going to put this bear over in this field. I don't really want to. And I'm putting it next to a place where that bear might be chased away by the storms. I don't know. Here we go. And there's just so much tension and fear and shaking fists at your no a bear any place but that one place and it's just so much fun i had a great time playing this at the convention with jen and a friend of ours selma and shay and we all really enjoyed it quite a bit this is such a huge huge step up from its predecessor savannah park that i think i need to seek it out now and upgrade my personal collection because caldera park is Fantastic. Um, a big, big improvement. All right. Now, let's talk about number eight on the list. 
Salton Sea, uh, which is a modern day business simulation uh, about geothermal energy production and lithium production in the Salton Sea, which is a blighted area in Southern California um, that happens to be sitting on one of the biggest lithium deposits in the world. And so this is something that's happening in the real world right now, that there is a new uh, gold rush going on of trying to mine lithium because lithium is one of the backbones of a potential green future for humanity. So it's a very very timely subject matter. And one of the things I have about I want to say that I very much respect about this game is the first two pages are a very dense technical summary uh, of how lithium uh, mining and processing works and how it creates geothermal energy to power homes as a side effect of the ability to make more batteries that makes um, you know green energy, solar and wind a more sustainable future and all that. So there's a lot that I really appreciate and I learned uh, quite a bit from this game. But at the same time, I do have to give them a black eye because at no point in all that did they talk about the environmental concerns and the hazardous, the dangers of lithium mining. And I wish they had done that. Um, because that's really my one big complaint about the game is that uh, this game is almost a propaganda piece in favor of lithium mining. And don't get me wrong, we need to do lithium mining. We It's all hands on deck. Um, you know, And even with environmental degradation and potential side effect and knock-on issues, we need to be doing this stuff. And I wish the game had grappled with that some. Instead, it just kind of abstracts that out and says, hey, capitalism, let's make as much money as we can um, by doing this thing. And um, because lithium mining is important, but it's very important that we hold our uh, publicly elected officials to account and make sure that they regulate this properly and there's none of that in the game. There's a tiny bit in that you have to... One of the things you try to grab in this business simulation is mining rights. And that's it. There's no talk about you know environmental knock-ons or what it does to the uh, the local populations. And I wish that had come into the game because it would have made... The, it means it would have shown the dark side. It would have been a richer, even more complex game and they left all that on the side and they didn't even talk about it in the rule book. So that's my big complaint about the game. Game, a real missed opportunity from Publisher De Beer. I hope it's something that at the very least in future reprints of it, they include another page devoted to the downside of lithium mining. But with that out of the way, let's just talk about the game. Because the game itself is freaking brilliant. Now, it is a very dry simulation. I've seen some people complain that there's not enough theme here, and I get that, but there's enough for me. Um, and what's really cool about this game is the core central conceit. Uh, it is a worker placement game where you have money cards. That's your money that you spend to run your operations, expand business, you know, drill more, you know, uh, process the br the brine you're creating into energy and all that. But to spend money, you have to give up these cards. And here's the deal. These are multi-use cards. Because the other side of every money card you've got is a worker placement space. So every time you spend money, you're throwing away your most powerful worker placement actions. But by the same token... If you instead take one of your money cards, put it on the table, and then put a worker on it to do a really cool, powerful action, you've tied up all your capital, and now you don't have your money to spend to do whatever action you need to do. And that core idea is so brilliant. One of the coolest new ideas I've seen in worker placement in years. And I love it. It creates so much excitement and tension. And this game is super challenging. It's incredibly tight. Money is... I mean, you have to work really, really hard to succeed and make that money. And then you tie all that money up or you throw that money away to invest in something else. And now you've given up that really awesome worker placement action. But sometimes that's the right move. It's a brilliant economic industry simulation. And I love it for that. I rank it higher for that. I am knocking it down a few pegs, though, because they had the opportunity to... Well, they did. They educate about the upside. And I loved it. I was really fascinated. I did not even know that there was the knock-on effect of almost for free creating geothermal energy out of lithium. But they didn't talk about the downsides, and I wish they had. And I wish they had worked that into the simulation as well. And that would have put it even higher on the list. Although, I still rank it pretty highly. Number eight of the month, <clears throat> Salt and Sea. Alrighty, now let's move on to number seven. Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, which is a sponsor preview I did. It's going to be crowdfunding in April. And I'm just going to tell you right now, folks, wow. 
this has got to be the most epic of all the tiny epic games. And that is certainly very appropriate uh, considering the subject matter, you know, Game of Thrones. And it's amazing to me how um, a tiny footprint, just a tiny collection of cards, captures the grandness and the bombacity of a massive, um, you know, area control, um, uh, you know, game of treachery and betrayal and temporary alliances. Everything you expect from Game of Thrones. And in case you've ever played it, the original Game of Thrones game from Is It Fantasy Flight, I played that game many, many years ago. It took four hours to play the thing. I would never play it again. But here's the deal. Tiny Epic Game of Thrones gives you everything that game gives you in a tight, super fast-playing, brilliant little package. And I was absolutely blown away by it. It is, at its heart, a dice worker placement game where every round we're going to roll some dice and these dice give you access to different actions like moving your troops around on the board, recruiting more troops, um, you know, moving via, you know, marching along this, uh, you know, uh, you know, along the countryside or sailing, um, using the special powers of cards, um, you know, and, and your and your own, you know, like Jamie Lannister or or Olana Tyrell. That's who I played with in my run through, which you'll be seeing soon. But here's the thing that really made and uh, and the thing is, after you roll all these dice, it's a pool that everybody drafts from. And um, so, say I grab a march because I really need to march. When my turn comes around, I get to take that march die. I get to place it on a central worker placement board, and whatever action that's still available to me on the board, I get to do that action plus the march. So I get to do a special thing like recruit. Say I get the march because oh, okay, I'm going to recruit some troops, and so I put it on the recruit space, and then I recruit those troops, and now I tell them to march. Because uh, that's the die I drafted. So every turn, you're getting to do two actions. The die you drafted plus one of the remaining worker placement spots on the board. But then here's the trick. After I'm done, everybody gets to use the die I just did. So now everybody gets to march, but I marched first. Did I march into your neck of the woods and knock you out of, of, of the pike or King's Landing or whatever? Did I take the Iron Throne? Well, now you get to march and you can move right back in. And now I got to defend myself using, um, and you're using my die. But I know because after everybody's drafted, we can see what's going to happen. I can see, oh, well, you're going to trigger special effects. You're going to march. You're going to sale, you're going to march, and you're going to recruit. That's the order of effects I get to do off of everybody else's turn. And we can see this, so we can plot out our entire round. And the game only lasts for six rounds, and yet so much happens. You know, vying for the Iron Throne and moving troops around and all of that. It's amazing. But I've only told you half the story. Because while it's a big part of it is what you would expect, moving your troops around, engaging in battles, kicking other people out, trying to hold on to territory so you can score points, right? You'd expect that. But as part of setup, every time you play this game, three of the uh, houses of Westeros are going to be set off to the side. And they are neutral in the Game of Thrones. They're not allied with any party. And I could be spending my time and effort getting troops on the board to take land, or instead, I could be spending all my time and effort uh, doing favors for the unaligned um, houses so that they will join me, so that all of their troops become my troops, so that their special powers become my special powers. But then the trick is, once I've got um, the Starks on board, and I'm the King of Winterfell, uh, the King of the North, because I, you know, because the the Starks are working with me, because I have spent so much time getting influence with them, and I'm using their troops in addition to my own, and they're working together with me, somebody else could sneak up and do some favors for the Starks, and then the Starks will switch, and then suddenly all those troops that I invested in and put them on the table, they belong to you now. And I'm like, oh no! So I've got to maintain my alliance with the Starks or fear losing it. So... That's a cool extra element on top of everything else I've just said. And then I'm still not done, folks. Because, as you'll find, when it gets uh, crowdfunding, and remember this was a sponsored preview, um, I just described the base game. But then there is an expansion you can pick up as well called Ice and Fire. It, everything I just said is still true, but now it's a cooperative game where players, instead of being at each other's throats trying to outmaneuver each other, now have to use all those cool powers, the dice worker placement, the, uh, the uh, trying to get influence with the houses, controlling terrain um, to score points. You have to use it in a desperate battle to hold back the Night King and his army of White Walkers who 
are spreading across the map like uh, like a virus, like the cubes in Pandemic, and we are desperately working together to push them all back north of the wall and save Westeros. And um, uh, that's amazing too. And if all this weren't enough, that you get an amazing co-op, I think it's the first time you've ever gotten to play Game of Thrones as a pure co-op if you want to do that. Um, and you've got this huge game that plays so fast in a tiny little box because it's a tiny epic game. Also, it's got amazing solo mode too that works so well. And you can use the solo mode in the competitive version and the cooperative version. And I'm blown away by it, folks. Like I said, this is the most epic the Gameland Tiny Epic series has ever been. And it delivers in a way that I might not have thought possible. It is so impressive. You'll see my run through soon when the game uh, launches on crowdfunding in April. That is number seven of the month. The Tiny Epic Game of Thrones. All right, now let's go on to number six, Comet. Now, this is a cool little unassuming game that is totally flying under the radar. It came out, I think, at Essence Spiel last year, got a very limited uh, print run, and uh, nobody is talking about it. And that's a real shame because this game is amazing. My wife loved this game so much. Um, a spoiler for the most recent Gen Jog, she gave it a 5 out of 5. She maybe gives like 10 or 12 of those a year. This game is, she loves it so much. And I love it too. What is it? Well, it's prehistoric times. A common is about to smash in and, you know, you know, cause a huge extinction level event. And it's our job to hat. We have a handful of cards. We can play cards to the board to hatch these animals. Um, and we need to get them to safety. We need to get them to sanctuary. We need to, it's a land before time, basically. We need to get them to the safe cave so they won't get wiped out when the comet shows up. And here's the deal. It's a multi-use card game. Because I've got these cards, I want to play them to hatch more of these creatures that I need to save. Because once I save them, the creatures will help me because they give me access to cool special powers that I can use on future turns. Here's the problem, though. Once I've hatched them, I've got to move them through this terrain across water and jungle and desert and, and lava-filled mountains and stuff like that. How do I move them? By sacrificing other cards. Every card is a, t a creature that you could save, or you could discard the card, and that gives you movement points to move move through the terrain to split amongst all the different creatures you're trying to protect to get to safety. It is sharp. It is fast. It is fun. Like I said, both Jen and I enjoyed it quite a bit. We've played it several times now. There's so much variety. There's so many cool special powers, all the different powers for the different types of animals. Um, and uh, while Jen, it, was, I, it wasn't her favorite, but it was her second most favorite game of the month, I'm a little bit cooler on it for one reason. And it's, a, it's unfortunately a bigger... Two reasons. One, it's a real shame. It's a two-sided board. You can play on either side and it kind of changes the layout. I don't understand why one of those sides wasn't a side devoted for two-player gameplay to tighten the board up. Because they don't do that. It's like they didn't really... The, the, the publishers don't seem to care about the two-player experience. This game is clearly designed to work at its best at a higher player count. Now, don't get me wrong. Jen and I loved it as a two-player game. It's just that... The board is very wide open, and they should have had a two-player board. To t it would be even better. Because one of the things I didn't mention, if you um, can get your pieces that are moving to safety, if you can get them lined up right, you can create avenues that let you hopscotch, like checkers, you know, jumping over one or more tokens to get to safety faster. So a big part of this game is strategizing to get your pieces together so that they can just piggyback off of each other and get safety sooner. But if you're doing that, if you've created a chain like that that lets you jump around, I want to get my pieces over so I can jump over your pieces as well and benefit from that. And, and if you see my pieces coming towards yours, you want to break yours up um, so or get away from me. So there's this kind of um, you know interactivity between players that's kind of passive and positive that's really cool. And it would happen a lot more at a two-player game if the board was tighter. So I do have to knock them down a couple of notches because they did not... Do, one of the two sides of the board should have been a tight board for lower player counts, and they didn't do that. The other problem is a production issue. Um, there is a mistranslation or an oversight in the English rules that um, describes how one of the powers, the power for wallabies works. And because they mistranslate it into English, there is, at a low player count, the opportunity that the game can get stuck in an infinite, never-ending loop. 
Uh, because the Wallabies can fix it so that the timer of the game gets broken and it will never, ever end. And that's unfortunate. In I went and I wa- look, I did a translation of the German rules, and the German rules made uh, perfectly clear that that can't happen. And they were mistranslated into English. So that's something you got to know going in. In case you ever do pick us up and you don't have the original German rules, here's the trick, folks. If you get multiple Wallabies, you only get to use their power once. Even if you got four Wallabies, you don't get to get four extra gold cards. You only... The Wallabies he says, hey, instead of when I rest, draw silver cards, which is the timer of the game. When with silver cards run out, the game is over. And Wallabies say, oh, instead of drawing silver cards, draw gold cards instead. So you would think, oh, if I've got four Wallabies saved, I can draw four gold cards. No, you can only draw one, no matter how many Wallabies you've got. It says that in the German rulebook. It does not say that in the English rulebook. And it makes the two-player game broken. Until I looked in the German rulebook and figured out, oh, this is the way it's supposed to work. So I got to knock it down for that, because this would have been in my top three of the month otherwise, folks. And here's the deal. In spite of the fact that they didn't tighten the board up for two, I enjoyed it so much, and my wife enjoyed it so much. This is a keeper for us. When played correctly, number six of the month is Comet. Okay, now... Let's go on to number five of the month, Cat Pack. Now, this is a sponsored uh, preview I did for a game that's going to be crowdfunding very soon. And actually, it it tried to crowdfund last year, and it didn't quite hit its goals, and so they're going to be relaunching. And honestly, folks, I don't understand why it failed the first time, but I'm not complaining because it gave me a chance to play this now. This game is freaking phenomenal. First of all, just to get this out of the way, it has... Some of the best, most charming, lovely cat cartoon art I've ever seen in my life in a game or anywhere. Uh, It comes with a hundred unique pieces of cat art, and they're cool, and they're charming, and they're quirky, and they're funny. Look at the treasure hunter there. And, um, you know, we just enjoy just looking, and we're not even cat people, we're dog people. I kind of wish this was dog pack, but still, the cats are so sweet and charming that we loved it. But... Here's the deal. It's a really simple game. At its heart, what you do is, on your turn, you've got a handful of cat cards. You're trying to add them to your pack, you know, lay them out, but you got a jigsaw puzzle them together because they've got different colored icons and you have to line them up. Green has to go next to green, blue has to go next to blue. So it create the more things you lay down, the more options you have, but the tougher it gets to squeeze things into those tight spaces. When you play a card, you get benefits. Sometimes you get immediate benefits. Sometimes you get end of round income benefits. So it's kind of a little bit of an engine builder to it as well. Um... And uh, the trick is, to play these cards, you have to spend catnip to get the cats to join your pack. Uh, you can you can spend catnip if you got catnip tokens, because maybe some cats will give you catnip. But also, if you've got cards in hand, you can discard cards, because every cat card you have on the back is a picture of catnip. So this is one of those race for the galaxy, spend cards to play cards thing. And just that so elevates this game. Because here's the deal, folks. This looks like a charming, simple, fast-playing little gateway game to play with your aunt or your grandmother or your kids who love cats. And and it succeeds at that. I think you could teach this game to just about anybody. But this is a crunchy game. Because you're you're having to figure out what to sacrifice to play what you want. Where to put them. When to play them to trigger bonuses that will help you play other stuff. There's a draft going on on as well. Plus, um, the corners of these cards, if you can get four corners with a little star shine symbol next to each other, that's one of the main ways you score points. So the complexity of trying to lay these out is surprisingly deep. Like, I'm talking calico level deep, if we were to make another uh, cat reference, cat game reference. And yet, the core gameplay is so clean and simple and elegant, and the presentation is so wonderful and charming. Also, not for nothing, it has a great solo mode, which you'll get to see uh, in my run-through when it goes live for its second attempt. And oh man, I so hope this thing succeeds, because I think it's brilliant, and so does my wife, Jen. It definitely deserves a lot more love. Number five of the month, Cat Pack. All right, now let's move on to number four of the month, Horror on the Orient Express, which is a brilliant um, cooperative adventure game set in the Call of Cthulhu Mythos. Apparently, this is based on a very popular um, uh, Cthulhu storyline from the role-playing game, I guess, where the Orient Express, you know, that um, that romantic train that travels all through Europe, has unfortunately gone through a portal and is now in hell, or 
or in what's called the Dreamlands, I think, or something like that. And um, But there's still a murder mystery going on. Instead of uh, murder on the Orient Express, it's horror on the Orient Express because now that we are in the Dreamlands and the train is on a fast road to the end of the line, is going to um, you know be the death of us all, we are still just regular passengers. Uh, you know, a, 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 a preacher, a, a scientist, um, a, a, a millionaire playboy who are on the train trying to solve a mystery. Because there are every time you play, there's six passengers. Two of those passengers are the evil cultists who have you know done the portal that pulled us into this alternate reality. And we have to find them. And we have to expose them so we can get out alive. And so we are spending a good deal of time moving back and forth to the different um, train cars. Each train car has its own special power. They're full of um, passengers. And we need to go to the right place at the right time to talk to the right passengers to uncover clues of about the uh, suspects, they're called, the six suspects, to figure out which ones are the um, cultists. Because if we can't figure out the cultists, before the train reaches the end of the line, we lose. So, uh, and to do this, the game comes with such a cool little push-your-luck game of pulling chips out of a bag to represent a conversation and hoping the conversation goes in the direction you want and doesn't bust and blow up in your face and you get no information and you wasted your time and you made the person you were talking to angry. And if they're the more angry they are, the closer they are to going insane and the more insane passengers there are, the more powerful the bad guys get. Oh, because did I mention? We are in a, a horrific hellscape and there's monsters trying to destroy the train. So, while we're doing our you know, Agatha Christie style investigation game. We're also playing a pandemic style. Oh my gosh, the monsters are going to destroy us. And there's a vampire who's, you know, feeding and we have to move around and stop all of these threats by moving from place to place and exert our influence and do all kinds of things while still trying to solve a mystery at the same time. It is amazing how well these two completely different games mesh together beautifully. And it's incredible. Here's the deal, folks. I'll tell you how good it is. Um, I thought Jen was going to hate this game because she hates Cthulhu stuff. She hates gross, scary monsters. And to be fair, the miniatures in this game are grotesque. Straight out of Cthulian uh, mythos nightmare fuel type stuff. And they're big, too. They're big, chunky beasts. Um, and I thought, oh, this is just going to be too dark for her. And she loved it as well. She gave it four out of five stars. She loved this game so much. In spite of her distaste for the grim, grotesque subject matter. Folks, you'll be able to see my run-through for this very soon. It's going to be crowdfunding, and this is going to be freaking huge. I'll talk about it more in the final thoughts there. But suffice to say, Horror on the Orient Express does not disappoint. It's number four of the month. Okay, now let's go on to number three of the month, AI 100% Human. Now, this is a game um, that's going to be crowdfunding uh, later on in the year. I think sometime in the summer. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I do, This is not a sponsored playthrough. I just got a chance to play this at the Dice Tower West Library. They were doing demos. I sat down because I so loved the previous game from this publisher. The publisher is Explore 8. Their previous game was Federation. You can go back and watch my run through Federation. I thought that game was a brilliant worker placement game that basically replicates the Fed United Federation of Planets, but we're trying to manipulate senators and stuff like that, and it was brilliant. So I wanted to see what Explorate had coming next. So I sat down, played AI 100% Human with my wife, Jen, and uh, a couple other showgoers, and was blown away by it. That's heart. Oh, and by the way, I should say, there's not really any pictures of it out there. There's no videos, but this is um, the Twitch channel Penelope Gaming French. This is a because Explorate is a French channel. So if you want to see it in action and you can speak and understand French, you can go watch this video. I'll have a link for it and for everything I'm showing down in the show notes. Thank you, Penelope, for giving me something to show here uh, because there's not much on Board Game Geek yet. Anyway, though, what this game is is at its heart, it's a Seven Wonders uh, Sushi Go style closed drafting, right? Where I've got a hand, you hand. Hand me a handful of cards that you didn't keep. I take one of them and then hand the rest to, you know, around the corner. And we do that. I've seen this in so many games over the years, ever since Seven Wonders popularized it. But this game, which is all about trying to create ideal AI, right? It's human-designed AI. We're trying to build a, what is it? Ultimately, a 3 by 5 grid of cards that represents the AI we're developing. You know, the chat GPT style, um, you know, adaptive learning algorithm that we're making. And each one of these cards, when we play them, has some type of scoring effect. Uh, hey, I want to be played in a column with nothing but red cards, or I want to be played surrounded by other cards, or I want to be played as part of a straight next to each other, or, or I want to be surrounded by cards that are lower numbers than me, or whatever. You know, they all 
had these different subroutines that they need to run at peak efficiency, and you have to play them into your grid. But the thing is, they score immediately as soon as you play them. And I might get this card, and I might have an overarching goal, because we all have secret goals, uh, or and, there, and there's other public goals as well. There's lots of different objectives that um, get infused into this game. You're trying to make the best combination of all these objectives, right? And so you hand me the cards, I'm like, oh, this is the perfect card for me. But if I play it right now, it'll help me at the end of the game, but it'll give me nothing. I'll be wasting it because it wants to be um, the last card put in a column, and I can't finish a column yet. So here's what here's here's the the fundamental game changer in terms of this style of game. When you hand me those five cards, and I'm going to take one of those five cards, I'm not going to play it immediately. Instead, I'm going to put it in my reserve. At any given time, I've got three cards. Two that are in my hand already, plus one of the ones I um, keep that you handed me, and then I turn the next four onto the next player. When it After I've chosen one and then handed the rest to my neighbor, I then look at my reserve. The card I just claimed, plus ones that I have claimed in previous rounds. And I play one of them. And it's a simple... Tiny, tiny twist, and yet it so explodes the possibility space of a closed drafting game. And honestly, it is going to be hard for me to go back to playing Seven Wonders, or Notre Dame, or... Um uh, you know, Cosmic Colonies. There are so many amazing closed drafting games. I love this gameplay. Um, you know, uh, the one. For, I mean, there's so many of them. But this idea of, hey, when I claim the card, I don't have to play it. I'll put it in my reserve, and I'll now play that one I grabbed two turns ago because it took me two turns to build my grid, so that it was perfect for playing it right now. And so it's a brilliant design. Uh, it doesn't look like much. Now, I admit, I don't know what the final thing will look like. I was playing a prototype at the convention. They're playing a prototype here in the video. Maybe that's what it's going to look like, because at the end of the day, we are just we're programming subroutines into an AI. Um, so what is that going to look like? Maybe it just looks like this. But what it looks like is a brilliant, one of the best card drafting, closed-hand card drafting games of all time. Honestly, I would play this over Seven Wonders, quite frankly, because it adds so much depth and variety and control it's so smart. Watch for it, folks. Like I said, it's going to be crowdfunding later on in the year. I think in the summer. And I think everybody who gets a chance to play it, like me and Jen, is going to be very, very impressed by number three of the month. And this was not a sponsored preview, by the way, folks. I just got a chance to play it, so I'm just telling you about it. Number three of the month is AI 100% Human. All right. Now, let's move on to number two of the month, Inheritors. Now, this is a new game um, from co-designer Jeffrey CCH. And in a previous monthly roundup, I talked about playing my first of Jeffrey's games, Age of Civilization, and being blown away by that game. And it retroactively worked its way into my top 10 games of 2019. Age of Civilization is one of the best games of 2019. 2019 is the greatest year in all of board game history. So... By the transitive of property, that makes uh, Jeffrey CCH the designer of one of the greatest games of all time. And Age of Civilization is phenomenally brilliant. And ever since I got a chance to play that, and I've since bought it, because you can get it super cheap on Amazon, and I bought its sequel, Age of Galaxy, which I'm looking forward to as well, I have been on the lookout for more games from Jeffrey CCH. And I got to play one, again, at the Dice Tower West Library. It's called Inheritors. He has a co-designer, Kenneth uh, YWN. Don't know Kenneth, but I do know Jeffrey. And i got to tell you, folks... This game blew me and Jen away. And that cement, uh, solidifies and cements the fact that Jeffrey C.C.H. might, before too long, make it into my top 10 favorite designers because Age of Civilization was amazing and everybody who's played it agrees, for the most part. But ever since I said that, I've gotten so much feedback that, yes, where have you been? We have all think the game is amazing. Anyway, Inheritors is amazing too. And at its heart, it's a very simple game that kind of borrows and builds upon the legacy of Reiner Knizia's classic Lost Cities. Because what we're trying to do in this game, you got a handful of cards in your turn. Ideally, what you want to do is play straights. Hey, I've got a blue one. If I can get a blue two, I'll play it on the blue um, one. And if I can get a blue three, I'll play it on the blue two. And at the end of the game, if I've got a blue four on my blue stack, my blue is worth four points. And what that represents is the influence I've got with the blue kingdom, right? It's a fairly abstract game, but there is a game of, oh, it's royal intrigue and trying to ex um, you know, exert influence over these different uh, kingdoms, right? Because uh, we're viziers or whatever it might be. But anyway, 
That's just the beginning because this is one of the uh, most expansive multi-use card style games there is. Because the simplest use is a card, just play to your board so it's worth points if you can build these straights. But more often than not, you can't because you don't have the right cards to build up the influence. So what you do is you discard these cards. And you can discard these cards to draw cards blind from the deck. But every time you discard cards, you're putting them out on the table in one of these three stacks. Very Seven Wonder, or a Lost Continent style, that then other other players might grab, and you're worried every time you discard a card, am I discarding the card that you want? Am I going to win you the game? Because I can see you need a blue three. I don't need this blue three. I need to get rid of this blue three so I can do something else. But then I'm giving you the blue three. What am I going to do? Am I going to do that? So all that Lost City stuff is brilliant here, especially because it works for a more than two players. You can play it, I think, up to four. Um, but anyway, it's a great two-player game too. Jen, I loved it. But that's just the beginning. That's one of the things you can do when you discard your card, is draw some cards blind. Or instead, like in this picture right here, if I discarded a blue card, I could grab everything in this stack because I played a blue card. Or instead, if I discard a six, I can grab everything in this stack because I discarded a six. So these cards, their discard function has multi-use. Discard it to draw draw blind or discard specific things to grab specific stuff. Because somebody might see I want that blue three and they bury it a bunch under a bunch of stuff. Well, okay, then I got to find a way to get it back out. But that's not all. You can also, disc if you get sets of cards in your hand, you can discard them to give yourself quests, which give you special, unique, secret objectives you're chasing after. Never mind the fact that as you build influence in the five different regions, you will eventually unlock access to the, um, the, the advisor tiles. And every time you play, there's going to be these five different animal advisors, and it's going to be a different combination of them every time you play. They all have different powers. We're racing to get those powers that you can then use for the rest of the game if you've gotten in good with the forest um, kingdom or the, the mountain kingdom or whatever it is. And every time you play, like I said, there's ten of these, and you're only going to have five. So there's going to be a lot of variety there, too. Plus, I've only talked about the cards in my hand that have a number and a color associated with them. But there are other cards that give you special powers as well. So you can discard them to do cool things like manipulate the board and do all kinds of extra stuff. The game is brilliant. Um, Jeffrey CCH continues to blow me away. Um, you know, And I can't wait to see what he comes up with next. Can't wait to find out, what does the CCH stand for? Does it say here on Board Game Geek? Um, nope, he's just a passionate um, game designer from Hong Kong and is a founder of Ice Makes. And folks, I got to tell you, um, you got to watch for Jeffrey. Uh, 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 so far, he is batting a thousand some of the best games. I like this so much, I got a copy of it. I've already rated it. Um, it's amazing. It's my number two of the month. I cannot recommend it highly enough, Inheritors. But folks, in every contest, there must be an ultimate winner. And we have a new game of the month for you. It is Windmill Valley. From designer Danny Garcia. Fast becoming one of them. Another designer who is new on the scene and is so rocketing up the ranks as to my favorite designers of all time. And I played last year, he had such an amazing debut year with um, Barcelona and Arborea, right? This is going to be his third game, coming again from Board and Dice, you know, his, uh, you know, who he partnered with for uh, Barcelona. Uh, it's Windmill Valley. And it answers the question that some people who love Zolkin the Mayan calendar might ask. Hey, Zolkin is awesome with these spinning gears. When are we going to get more games with spinning gears? It's been a decade. I want more spinning gears. D Designer Danny Garcia and publisher Board and Dice said, hold my beer, Zolkin, because they have done the ultimate spinning gears game. Everybody has their own private windmill that has two gears on it. And unlike Zolkin the Mayan calendar, where you get to rotate that thing, what, 16 times over the course of the game and it barely ever moves at all, in this game, every turn, you are spinning these gears like crazy. And it's so fun and it's so satisfying. Especially because... Oh, went the wrong way. Let's go back to the other pictures. The spokes... Let's see if there's a close-up of this little gear thing. The spokes of our two windmills that we're spinning... Um, so that on the beginning of my turn, I get to spin this thing. How far I spin is based on the speed of the water. Because we can open or close the dams to increase or decrease the speed of water, which affects how everybody's windmill spins. If, everybody, if the water's fast 
fast, everybody spins their windmill three times. And other players might say, no, why'd you speed it up? I'm going to skip the combo because once these two wheels spin, it will make two different spokes next to each other. And you can activate one or sometimes both of the spokes together in really cool combo moves. But depending on the water, you might skip those combos. So we have to exert control over the water to speed it up or slow it down so we can then spin our wheels to get the right powers, the base ones or the ones we've upgraded by putting new things in to then trigger all kinds of cool special abilities. Because this is a big game with lots of stuff going on, but not a lot of pictures on Board Game Geek, apparently. What is the best picture? Okay. So, in this game, the stuff we can do based off our windmills is build um, actual windmills in kind of this like route building area control battle for dominance of the, of the main board. But you could ignore that completely and instead focus on the market, buying and selling tulips for profit. Or you could just focus on your own board, trying to grow and um, you'll fill in your own um, fields of tulips to get bonus points there, depending on if you can create certain patterns and stuff like that. Uh, it also has kind of a, a, a hint of burgundy because when you get those tulips you don't use them immediately they go into a queue and then you have to deploy them later over multiple steps uh, there is so much going on in this game uh, folks I'm telling you right now this is going to make a lot of top 10 of the years for 2024. When it comes out later this year and people get their hands on it and they say, uh, Zulkin, the Mayan, what? I There was a the game previously this had gears? Because this game, Bill, stands on the shoulders of giants and so destroys those giants. This game is so rich, so robust, so much fun. Also, not for nothing, so pretty. This might be the prettiest game Board and Dice has ever produced. Its, it's color palette is just delightful and it never gets old spinning those gears uh, to succeed in my number one game of the month, Windmill Valley. And that's it, folks. Another month done and dusted. Some really amazing games. It was a great way to end our epic road trip uh, at the Dice Tower West Convention Library. I want to say thanks to Tim and Tom and everybody who makes that such an amazing convention. Uh, Jen and I had so much fun, played so many great games, and I really enjoyed telling you about them. And then also in closing, let me say thank you to sponsor of the show. Oh, that's very bright right there. Um, Arcane Wonders with their awesome new expansion, the Mundo Wonder Pack. I'm telling you right now, folks, this is a must-have for fans of World Wonders, which is right back there. I love the game. I love it even more with uh, uh, the Mundo expansion. And that is it, folks. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks to Arcane Wonders for sponsoring the show. Have a nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye